so, new heaven, same you. Perfect. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, let's go to the next slide. So, new year, new you. I'm sure everyone has heard this phrase before. Uh, we're still kind of at the beginning of the year, and so it is uh, common for people to kind of use this phrase to, to say that they want to start anew, that they want to have a fresh start to things, and that they want to go and start all these new and different New Year's resolutions. Um, so I went and I Googled what are the top New Year's resolutions, and it turns out that Forbes magazine had done a survey of 1,005 people to find out what the top New Year's resolutions were for 2023. Does anybody have any guess to what the first, the top New Year's resolution was? You know, that's what I thought too. I was like, lose weight is always like number one on people's, especially in America. But uh, this year there was actually something slightly different for that top one. So you can click the next slide. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so actually for this year, for 2023, could be because of all of the craziness that's been happening, the top New Year's resolution was to improve your mental health. Next was improved fitness and then losing weight. So you guys were top of the list, you know, top three. You're almost there. Uh, and then improve diet and improve finances. So uh, we always have these lofty goals whenever we start our new year. We always plan on doing so many things, and this year is going to be different. This year we're going to have so many different things, you know, we're going to be working out, we're going to get our finances right, we're going to get all of these things as they should be. But unfortunately, <laughs> this is normally what ends up happening. We start the year with some great ideas, and then by the end of the year, we end up right back where we started off. So, it turns out that again, uh, another survey was done, and only about 55% of people follow through with the New Year's resolutions that they have. So it is, it's kind of a 50-50 shot whether you're going to make it or not. Uh, they also have done some studies to find out what causes people to meet these goals. So they found that positive goals are, are more beneficial in comparison to negative goals. So what does that mean? So instead of saying things like, I won't watch as much TV, or I'm go I won't eat after 8 p.m., or I will stop smoking, those goals are not as effective as I will run five kilometers each week, or I will read one book a month, or I will sleep at least seven hours each night. These positive goals tend to actually get you that better change than those negative goals. Also, setting realistic expectations is key. So, if you have never been somebody who likes to run, saying that you're going to run 10 kilometers a day is probably not the best idea for you. Or if you're somebody who, you know, has routinely eaten bad food and had problems with quitting that, you know, setting a, a kick to cut out all of the junk food from your life from day one probably won't work as well. So people, I think, get a little bit uh, drawn into this new year, new you hype. And that can also carry over into our Christian life. So we have uh, our scripture reading for today is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 uh, to 54. And it says, In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself, sorry, for the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So let's take a look at, at this verse and see what it is and what it isn't saying. So clearly, in this verse, it, it brings out an instantaneous change. It says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. So instantaneous, the drop of a hat, something will happen. But what does it say is going to happen? It says that our 
imperish our perishable body will be changed into the imperishable body, and that our mortal will put on immortality. So these changes that come about at this time, and for anybody who doesn't know, this is talking about when Jesus comes back for his second, uh, second coming. So these changes that come about are purely for our body. They are for our mortal body. So, you know, we're, we won't be getting sick anymore. We won't have, you know, nearsightedness or Alzheimer's or any of those sorts of issues. But it says nothing here about our character or about our nature or about our, our thought process. Those things are not mentioned anywhere here. Now, why is that? Why is it that they're not mentioned here? The reason why is because although we may be going to a new heaven, it'll be the same us that's there. We will be carrying through our, our character, our, our thought processes, all those things will be the same in heaven. So this verse doesn't mention anything about the heart, only about the earthly body. Our desires, our characters, and our thoughts will carry over from this life. So, uh, we know that we're going to be made new when it gets to the new heaven, but there's a danger in us living as though something else, our, our thought process or our, our character, will change when we get to heaven. That, that's a fallacy. You know, people, people have this idea of, uh, you know, I'm not perfect, you know, we're just human, we don't have to worry about that. And they kind of use these things to put off and uh, delay change to their character. But there's a true danger that happens with that. Uh, I've heard a uh, pastor say previously, you know, what would be the change if Satan and all the fallen angels had died tonight? So let's just assume that tonight, while we're sleeping, God said, you know what, probation is closed for Satan and all of his angels and wipe them out. When we wake up tom tomorrow morning, would we feel any different? Would we want to change the movies that we watch? Would we want to change the music that we listen to or be nicer to people on the street? Sure, to an extent, some of that would change. But the pastor went on to say that, you know, a lot of times Satan doesn't have to do that much work to, to tempt us into doing things. We've already ingrained in our mind these pathways that lead us down towards these negative actions. So even if Satan were to be destroyed tonight, if we were to be in a perfect environment, we would still have a lot of these tendencies that draw us towards doing negative things. Uh, when, we, when we get to heaven, again, we have this, uh, this idea that things will be very different, but again, it's going to be the same you that's up in heaven. So, again, I said before, you know, I've heard people say this before. I said I was Christian, but I didn't say I was perfect. Uh, and again, these sorts of ideas and these sorts of um, comments start to help you to delay your, your character growth to a later time. Oh, uh, you know... I'm not perfect, you know, nobody's perfect, we'll put that off to a later date. You can't expect me to do this, you can't expect me to do that. And it's true, we, are, we aren't perfect right now, but we are to be working towards perfection. So we can use this verse as a crutch, at, or we can use this saying at times as a crutch to, to delay our growth. Uh, so, there was a... When I, when I first was in like high school, I always thought, you know, once I get a girlfriend, things are going to be different. It'll feel so much different. You know, life will be totally new. I finally got a girlfriend, felt exactly the same. It's like, okay, you know what? Girlfriend, that's, you know, you can get a girlfriend and lose a girlfriend in a night. That's not a big deal. But when I get engaged, that'll be a big deal. Like then I'll, I'll feel something different inside. And I got engaged. It was great. I think I did a great job. But after the engagement, I still felt the same. There was no grand change in my life. It wasn't that, you know, now I, I looked at the world and everything was peaches and roses. No. So then I thought, okay, you know, once I get married, marriage is a huge step. Marriage is going to truly feel like something different. I got married, and to my surprise, in a good way, you know, I didn't feel any different. 
Um, it felt exactly the same as it was before. Now I just live with Nina instead of <laughs> living down the street. So, and then in the last step, I always thought, okay, parenthood. Parenthood is going to feel much different. Of course, I don't have my child out next to me just yet, but in the same way, you know, I, I still feel the same. And I've talked to other adults about this as well, and they always say, like, yeah, you know, I still feel like I'm that 18-year-old. I still feel like I'm that 20-year-old. It's, it's hard. We don't feel different. Just because there's an outward change to our surroundings, we are still the same person. And that is what we want to take care of when it comes to heaven. So when we are preparing for heaven, we have to remember that there isn't going to be uh, an inward change in us when we get to heaven. That inward change is supposed to start now. So that change in heart, we have to have that change in heart. And if the heart isn't changed, then you're going to have a problem. So I'm not sure if anybody watches The Office, but it, I'm not sure if you can see that very well. But it says, just follow your heart, false. The heart is deceitful above all things. Follow Jesus. Amen. So we've been kind of fed this, this Disney attitude of, you know, follow your heart, follow your desires, do whatever you want to do sort of thing, and everything will work out fine. But again, the heart needs to be attuned to what God wants it to be. Our character must be changed into what God is calling us to be. And if it's not, we're going to run into other issues. So... Uh, this slide says, watch your thoughts because they lead to attitudes. Watch your attitudes because they lead to words. Watch your words because they lead to actions. Watch your actions because they lead to habits. Watch your habits because they lead to character. And watch your character because it determines your destiny. My dad always used to tell me, you know, character is the only thing that you're actually going to take with you to heaven. So this, this is the thing. We need to perfect our character now so that we can have the character that we want in heaven. So that, that begs the question, what are the qualities that heaven prizes? What are the character traits that we really want to grow here so that we can, we can have a, a fruitful and happy life in heaven? Uh, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. So all of these things are, are the things that we need to be cultivating now. These are the traits that we want to build here on earth so that we can take them into heaven with us. Let's just look at each one of these things uh, and imagine what heaven would be like. We'll start from the, the last one. So self-control. These are things... Could you imagine going up into heaven and nobody has any self-control? They're all just doing whatever they want, whenever they want, and as much as they want. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be heaven. That would be chaos. Everybody would doing, be doing just what they, they want all the time. Again, faithfulness. We need to cultivate that attitude of faithfulness now. If we don't have faithfulness now, and I mean, God has taught us how to do this in many different aspects with our life. I believe that uh, all the different aspects of our life can kind of teach all of these different things. So when you get married, you know, you learn that faithfulness. When you have a child, you learn that faithfulness that you need for heaven. So what would heaven be if we were all unfaithful? You know, if we could change at the drop of a dime, this, again, wouldn't be heaven, but chaos. So you can kind of go through each of these different things and see how character traits that are, if any of these character traits weren't there, heaven would not be a place to, that you would really want to be. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, I'm not here to tell you exactly what you need to work on with your character. Because at the end of the day, I think most of us know the things that truly are right for us to be doing. 1 John uh, 2 verse 21 says, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie comes from truth. You know, the, the truth is that inside of all of us with the, with the conscience, God has given us a way to be able to tell a little bit of right from wrong. 
Now, as I said before, you know, the heart is deceitfully of wicked, and so we need to rely on the Bible to build that conscience up. But to go through each and every character trait that heaven wants us, to, or that we should have for heaven, isn't exactly the plan of this, uh, this sermon here. But it is to talk about enduring to the end. The Bible says, for those that endure to the end, they will be saved. It's easy for us to die for what we believe in. Death is something that kind of happens for a lot of, a lot of cases instantly. Uh, if someone were to come in today and say, you know, if you believe in Jesus, stand up, and they have a gun in their hands, and they're going to shoot whoever stands up, that may be a lot easier than to live a life of servitude, to live a life of humility, to live a life where you have to constantly be dying to self daily. Um, so that's the, that's the goal, is so that we can grow daily. And that growth daily, that enduring to the end, can be much harder in many situations than a split one-time decision. So uh, this change has to happen now. How do we make sure that this change is going to be a lasting change in our life? Uh, people have set goals, and uh, we set goals all the time. But as Christians, we have to have a solid goal with God as our accountability partner. We have to have that humility to be able to, to listen to God when he speaks to us and to listen to his words. We also need that same humility to be able to listen to truth wherever it may come from. So truth is truth no matter the, the vehicle that it uses. Many times people feel as though, you know what, uh, I'm not going to take this from this kid or I'm not going to, you know, this person is beneath me or something like that. Like they don't know what they're talking about. And it's, it's really just your pride welling up inside of you. But we have to remember that Truth, no matter where it comes from, is still truth. Uh, the Bible says that we aren't to despise people's youth. We're not to push them away just because they're young. This doesn't just mean young in terms of age, but young in terms of spiritual growth as well. So again, we may have people who have you know, just become a Christian, and we say to them, oh, you know, this person is saying that, but they, they just started this like last week. I've been here, you know, I'm a second generation Adventist. I've been here, my parents were Adventists. They were the head, head elders, and so I know what to do and blah, blah, blah. But again, we need that humility to be able to listen to truth wherever it comes from. Some people's problems don't necessarily lie in not being humble, but humility is the first step to solving all problems. So if you have any problem, for example, if you have road rage, humility is the first step to that. Humility tells you, you know what, other people on the road make mistakes as well. So I need to humble myself, quiet down, calm down behind the, behind the wheel. With any marriage issue that you may have, humility is the driving factor that lets you say, you know what, let me listen to, to my spouse, let me humble myself, let me try out what they're saying, let me try to make this change to better myself. Ellen White has said before that uh, self is the root of all sin. So any sin that you can think of, it finds its cause and its root in our desire for self, in our desire for uh, self-gratification or for, to build ourself up. But humility is exactly the opposite of that. Humility is decreasing self. So humility can be one of the things that we use to kind of grow our character to be what God wants it to be. Uh, so Ellen White says in Desire of Ages 437, uh, it was not enough for the disciples of Jesus to be instructed as to the nature of his kingdom. When they, what they needed was a change of heart that they would bring them into harmony with its principles. Calling a little child to him, Jesus set him in the midst of them. Then tenderly folding the little one in his arms, he said, except ye be converted and become as children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The simplicity, the self-forgetfulness, and the confiding love of a little child are the attributes that heaven values. These are the characteristics of real greatness. 
Again, Jesus explained to the disciples that his kingdom is not characterized by earthly dignity and display. At the feet of Jesus, all these distractions are forgotten. The rich and the poor, the learned and the ignorant, meet together with no thought of caste or worldly preeminence. All meet as blood-bought souls, alike dependent upon one who redeemed them to God. So, we have to lay our titles down. We have to lay down at the feet of God our, our pride and all of these things and come as one that, that is welcome to all. Uh, the Bible says, you know, the first must be last and the last must be first. So we have to be able to give that up. We oftentimes think of, you know, who are the greats of Christianity? And we think of people like Moses. We think of Gideon. We think of... Uh, David, we think of all of these different people. But truly, the things that, that makes them great in heaven's eyes are not the things that make them great in our eyes. Moses, we think of him, you know, leading the, the children of Israel through the Red Sea and being such a great leader, guiding all of the people through this path. But the thing that made Moses great wasn't the fact that he led all of these people, but that he was willing to be led by God. The Bible says that there was nobody meeker in all the earth than Moses. When we think of Gideon, we think of how he was able to fight off such a large army with such a small amount of people. But again, the thing that made Gideon great wasn't the fact that he had such military conquest and military uh, advantage, but that he was willing to listen to what God said for him to do, even when it seemed illogical. And lastly, we think of David, you know, David and Goliath. This is a story that no matter who you are, you've heard of the story or at least know of the idea of David and Goliath. And we think, wow, to be so brave, to be a child and to go up against, you know, the forces of evil and a giant, somebody who's been at war for so long. But the, the attributes of David that really draw us, that make him great in heaven is, again, his humility towards God and his desire to do what God wanted him to do in any situation. These are the character traits that we want to manifest for heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 2, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humility and compassion are the culture of heaven. Humility doesn't only just allow us to accept Jesus, but accept those who Jesus also accepts. So what does that mean? Um, you know, we, we often see our life and going to heaven as from our perspective, as we should, because, you know, we're humans. We'll only ever have our own perspective. But let's, let's take a step behind the curtains for a second and see this from the perspective of the angels. The angels have seen, uh, they've seen the fall of Lucifer. They've seen what sin can do. And they see all of the destruction that can be caused by sin. Now, Jesus had said, hey, you know, these people on earth, these people, they've been following me. They've been, you know, progressing in character and truth. We're going to bring them up into heaven to live with us. Now, to me, <laughs> right now, that would be just a wee bit nerve-wracking. Because I saw what happened with Lucifer. And Lucifer had been with God for such a long time. He had known God, had been walking with God intimately, and sin was still such a destructive force that it not only took him down, but a third of the angels as well. Now, we've been living in a world that's been racked with sin. We've been steeped in sin all of this time, and God is calling us to live up in heaven with him. It, would take, it takes quite a bit of humility for the angels and trust for the angels to be able to say, you know what, God, we trust you. We trust the power that you've been working in their life, and we trust that they'll be fit for heaven. We have to remember that when we go to heaven, you know, we're going to be the, neighbor, the new neighbors on the block. Uh, this brings up another question for here on earth. So this is, the, this is the conundrum that the angels would have in heaven, but we have a conundrum similar on earth. When we think of the, the parable of the, the lost sheep, we often think of ourselves as that one lost sheep that, you know, Jesus is going, willing to go to any depth and to any height to try to get us back. But 
we also, it would be good to think about ourselves as one of the 99 as well. How are we going to act when Jesus brings that one lost sheep back? Are we going to welcome them with open arms or are we going to ostracize them and tell them, you know what, well, that was stupid for going off. What were you thinking? Why would you do that? These are things that we need to work on now. So humility will help us to humbly accept who Jesus accepts. Um, we need to accept that uh, accept others, accept newcomers into the faith with open arms and treat them as one of us. Also, we need that humility to help, to ask for help and to receive that help from others. So now, what are some practical ways in which we can change our character for heaven? How do we actually become changed? Um, Part of this change that happens is listening to our peers and listening to those around us. No matter the origin, truth is still truth. I've said this before. Uh, and listening to that truth, allowing it to come into your heart and allowing it to be part of you is one of the things that's going to help to, to change you. Uh, so the Bible says in Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45, uh, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept, clean, and put in order. So we've talked about, okay, listening to God, uh, having that humility to accept that things are wrong, and getting rid of some of these uh, improper character traits. But the thing is, if we don't fill ourselves with what is right, we run the risk of this same thing happening. Emptiness sets us up for relapse. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a similar issue to the Pharisees of the Bible. We have lots of rules that tell us what not to do, but we sometimes have some issues on saying what to do. We have lots of, you can't do this, but we oftentimes forget what we are supposed to do. Uh, having this void and this emptiness inside of us sets us up for failure in the future. When we, when we get rid of something, we need to replace that with something better. So uh, one of the things that would be beneficial for us to do is to put God into the things that we already enjoy. Be creative with what we enjoy and how to use it for God. So, uh, for example, if you are the kind of person who is, you know, a storyteller, a writer, you really enjoy making these works of fiction or anything like that, starting to make allegories, parables, starting to make these stories that have deep and complex meanings behind them that point to Jesus. If you really like to rock climb, for example, or you really like sports, or you really like any of these things, getting together with groups of people and enjoying these sports with other people and showing them your character can help to bring others towards God. There's many different things that we can do, and I think that we oftentimes get, um, get discouraged or maybe dissuaded by other people to say that, you know, this, this is a worldly thing, or this isn't of God, and so we, we cast it to the side. But I think there needs to be some prayer, uh, prayer in our lives to see how we can use the things that we love to draw other people towards Christ. Um, also, <laughs> on the other side of the coin, there are some times where, you know, we just need to give ourselves that, that break. So it could be that, you know, maybe we really love to watch TV and God is calling us, you know what, put the TV, put the remote down for a while and take up some time with me. So this is something that can't just be done on a whim. Don't just go home and say, well, Tim said that, uh, that we need to change the things that we like into godly things, so I'm going to gonna take this gambling and I'm going to gamble for God now and I'm going to gamble and whatever winnings I get, I'll give it to the church. That's not what I'm saying. Calm down. Uh, you have to make sure that you approach this prayerfully. So go and pray to God. And he, again, he wants to show us all ways that we can bring others towards him. So he will be open and willing to show you what you can do in this regard. Next, by beholding, we become changed. 
Uh, but the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Bible is so before its time. Um, we now in science know that there are such things as what's called mirror neurons, these mirror neurons are a set of pathways in your brain that fire when you see somebody doing something. Um, and so this is where a lot of our empathy kind of comes from. So they've done studies with monkeys and things like that, and they've had monkeys watching other monkeys, and they show them images of like, you know, a uh, monkey getting food and these sorts of things. And the same pathways light up in the monkey's mind as if they were getting food. Um, it's the same thing that we have with our own nature. So the things that we watch, the things that we, we expose ourselves to are going to affect our brain and actually affect the neurology that we have in our brain. Um, we need to saturate our th ourselves with godly things. When we saturate ourselves with godly things, we will be changed into that moment by moment. Nothing happens... Uh, except for the, the change that we'll have at the end of time. Nothing happens instantaneously like that. God calls us on, uh, on a path to endure. As I said before, when we endure to the end, that's when we'll, we'll have the victory. So to continue to expose yourself to more and more godly things will help us to grow that character. You know, in our, in our Christian life, the start of our Christian journey is usually characterized by baptism. So we go through, we learn about who Jesus is, and once we decide that we want to be a Christian, we go through the act of baptism. And baptism is a symbol of dying to self. Now, it's not just any death, but a death through drowning. Uh, and how exactly do you die through drowning? You have a bunch of stuff around you that goes inside of you and stops anything else from coming through. When we, dr when we drown, we die because we are surrounded by so much of something else that it floods our system. The Bible says that, the Bible makes many allusions to God being like water. Um, so that death that we're supposed to have in baptism is supposed to be a death to self because of our, our connection with God, because of our saturation with God. When we die due to drowning, we're, starving, we're filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit and starving out all of the things of the old man. So we are changed from the inside out with, uh, with this Christian walk. We must also be that change that we want to see. It says in James 4, verse 17, if anyone then knows good, they ought to do it. And if, and, sorry, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So as we go through this journey, as we saturate ourselves with God and let God into us, God will again open up more and more truths to us through our conscience, through the things that we read, and we'll have these uh, these pinpricks to our conscience. And it's that time when we should do those things. The more you exercise this, the stronger in faith and character you'll become. As we said before, um, we must watch our thoughts because they lead to attitudes, and attitudes lead to words, words lead to actions, actions to habits, and habits to character. And character leads to our destiny. So when God opens up these, uh, when God gives you these pinpricks of your conscience, it's our job to act on that, to do those things. Because when we start to do those things, it'll then become our habit. It'll become second nature. And this is the work that God wants to, to have in us. Uh, when we, this process is, is largely unseen. In Matthew 13, the, Jesus talks about the parable of the leaven. And he says that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. You know, you just put a little bit into a large amount of flour, and over time that whole bunch of flour will all grow. Uh, you can't see the action of the yeast happening. You just see the growth that happens over time. 
It's the same thing with plants. When we plant a seed, for a long time, for a few days, for a few weeks, you may not see any growth happening, but inside of that seed, there's germination happening, which soon will sprout up into a plant. There's a, there's a plant, a type of bamboo that must be, I think it's buried for like 10 years or something like that, and there's no growth that happens throughout that time, but you have to keep watering it and keep caring for that plant throughout that entire time, and once the seed germinates, it can grow up to a meter a day. So it's the same thing that can happen in our life. You know, we may not necessarily see outward change happening right now, but the more that we cultivate this attitude of humility, the more that we cultivate uh, this character growth and put ourselves in these situations, the more God will do his work on our lives and help us to grow and become who he wants us to be. Um, John Wooden, Wooden said, be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is who you, what you really are while your reputation is merely what other people think you are. So we, again, we, we have to not get lost in the sauce. We have to not, uh, you know, focus too much on how other people see us, but the truth of our character because, again, our character is going to be the only thing that we take to heaven with us. So in summary, change happens here on earth. Our character is grown here and will be taken to heaven. Our character is the only thing, in fact, that we'll, we'll take to heaven. So many people spend so much time working on their career, working on even friend and family relationships, working on getting the best house, the best car, working on all of these different things, but ultimately, the money that we have, we can't take to heaven. The house that we have, we can't take to heaven. Even if, now hear me out on this one, even if the friends that we have, we don't necessarily take them to heaven. It's their decision whether they would like to go to heaven or not. The only thing that we can take to heaven is our character, and that begins here. Uh, these change happens from the inside out, <clears throat> It's through letting the Holy Spirit into us that we get this change in our lives. And it's only with humility and with positive action that these change can end up coming through. Uh, so, in closing, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. You know, God is, is working at all of us. He wants to be with us all and he wants to change us all to be the person that he wants us to be and to help us grow our character. One last, uh, one last thing. It's, it's important to remember that although uh, we are to have a change in character, a change in character is not necessarily the same as a change in personality. Um, God asks us to have a better character and a more Christ-like character, but he's also created us all to be individuals. The things that you enjoy, whether you're a creative person, whether you're a musical person, whether you're an adventurous person, all of these things can be used towards God and be used for God. Uh, and God desires that diversity, even with the, the proper change in your character. So um, let's go ahead and close off with prayer now. Uh, and we'll, again, try to embody that change so that we'll be ready for heaven.